Merry Christmas, everybody, and a Happy New Year here in 2021. It is the Advent season, so we are quickly approaching the Christmas holiday. And as such, we are in the middle of Advent right now. And because of that, our episode today is going to be on the incarnation of Jesus Christ and what that means. We're going to look into it in depth. But real quick before we get into that, I mean, as you can tell, this is a little bit more of a loosey-goosey laid back episode. Um, But I wanted to give you a quick update on me. Um, Not many of you know, my name is Seth. And um, I'm not only just doing this, this podcast and blog and website stuff, um, you know, Instagram. I'm not just doing that just because I love God. I mean, that's one of the reasons I'm doing it. I am also called to be a pastor. And so beginning in January, I'm going to start a uh, seminary. I'm going to be attending Reformation Seminary. And this is a seminary that is completely online. It was founded by Dale Partridge. And you can uh, find out more about this ministry at relearn.org. That's R E L E A R N dot O R G. Um, And this is the first seminary designed specifically to equip men to become pastors who will plant house churches. That's right, house churches. Uh, Not just Bible studies, but they are planting churches in houses. Um, One of the reasons that we are drawn to this is just because of the the closeness, the close-knit nature that... um, that this will evoke in in our community with other believers is we want to be able to know the people who we're worshiping with and um, not just live life with them, not just have pizza parties and things, but to truly build one another up in the most holy faith. And um, this is a very unique, uh, this is a very unique seminary. This is a very unique way of looking at house churches because um, a lot of the house churches that I've looked into. They lack any kind of accountability. It's just kind of like, hey, throw a party, invite your friends and neighbors, and then you know, invite them to Jesus, and that's all fine. But as far as churches go, I wanted something that had accountability. I'm not just out here a lone gun making stuff up, um, you know, being on the top of the mountain. And uh, it, somebody can quickly fall into pride and error in that. And uh, I wanted to be a part of a, uh, a group, a ministry that was going to hold me accountable to the things in the Bible. And um, and so, yes, I will be accountable to the people in the house church, uh, but I will also be accountable to uh, the people at uh, Reformation Seminary and relearn.org. Um, but uh, if you want to know more about that, Dale Partridge does a much better job on his podcast and at that website of fleshing out the reason for these house churches. Um, and one big one that has become really prevalent over the last couple of years is the persecution that churches have been facing um, just over health uh, things, you know, stuff that that uh, the government has been imposing because of, uh, you know, uh, pandemics and such. A lot of churches around the world have had to close their doors and are now considering ways of uh, keeping people from worshiping with them unless they uh, do certain things um, that I'm not going to talk about right here, um, you know. People are trying to get, you know, vaccine passports and mandates and things like that. Like you have to have a vaccination card in order to go to Sunday worship. There, I said it. Um, And this is just an unbiblical concept. So uh, the idea of the house church um, springing up in these particularly persecuted areas is to make it possible for people to gather to worship with an orthodox group of believers who truly wish to serve Jesus Christ despite what the government is trying to tell them. And there's a whole other uh, issue about you know civil magistrates and their authority that I would love to get into, and uh, that's not the episode today. But this is an update on me, not an update on uh, the goings on around the world. You know what's going on around the world. Let's not pretend. Um. So as far as uh, seminary goes, I will be 
the third class to graduate from Reformation Seminary. I'm excited about that. Um, the first class just graduated this November. Uh, you can listen to the commencement speech uh, on uh, on Real Christianity. That's Dale's podcast, Real Christianity. I will be graduating in November of 2022. And uh, as I said, this is an entirely online program. So it is available internationally. If for some reason you are listening to this and you are a man who has the desire to plant a biblical house church, then um, I, and you're called to be a pastor, I would highly encourage you uh, to go to reformationseminary.com to start the application process. Or if you know somebody who is called to be a pastor and is looking into things, um, send them to reformationseminary.com to apply. Um, and so my my thing is that I would ask that you would please pray for me and my family as I start. Um, we know that this is going to be a strenuous year for us. It's going to stretch us in many ways, and we are we are prepared for that. We are trusting in God to supply all of our needs, um, and we, we certainly know that we have been told uh, it can be a very sanctifying process, and we are no strangers to sanctification. Uh, so we are willing to go um, to whatever God calls us to do. And uh, that even means if God calls us to go into a situation where it costs us our lives, then praise be to God, because Jesus didn't shrink back from that. And if that's what you are called to do in this life as a Christian, um, then praise God that you are counted worthy to share in the same sufferings as Christ. So I will try to post at least every other week in 2022. I cannot guarantee that I will be able to keep up with the demands of seminary and this side project. This is really just kind of a hobby and a, a labor of love for me. So this next year, I may be a less frequent in posting. As you can tell, like December and, and November were uh, rocky months for us, but we uh, we've been expanding our family. Uh, so time is precious, and uh, and so I just want to make you aware of those things. So I appreciate you all and your support and your prayers, and hopefully I will be giving you some updates as the year progresses. I'm very excited about this. Um, so with that being said, let's get into our topic for today, the incarnation. As we celebrate Advent and uh, and the coming of Christmas, what is Advent. Well, Advent, as defined in Webster's Dictionary in 1828, is uh, quite simply put as a coming. Appropriately, the coming of our Savior and in the calendar, it includes four Sabbaths before Christmas, beginning of St. Andrew's Day or on the next Sabbath day. Or uh, excuse me, or on the Sabbath next before or after it, it is intended as a season of devotion with reference to the coming of Christ in the flesh and his second coming to judge the world. Um, consequently, I never knew about St. Andrew's Day until I read this definition, also known as Andromus. That's interesting. Anyway, it is a feast day um, before the kickoff of Advent. For us, the feast day is Thanksgiving, uh, which is the Thursday before um, before the Sunday. Uh, yeah, anyway, you get it. You know how that works with the calendar. It's still morning. I'm still drinking coffee. So um, Advent is the coming of Christ. That is what we are celebrating. And not just the coming of Christ, but the coming of Christ specifically in the flesh. I, I know that seems like a, a really, um, you know, splitting of hairs. Yes, Christ came in the flesh, Seth. We know that. But it's it, the reason that wording is there is in order to, to keep people from falling into heresy. Let me take a sip of coffee. In the Advent season, we sing hymns, Advent hymns. One of the hymns that has been sticking out to me recently is the hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And this was a hymn written by Charles Wesley. Um, and also it looks like George Whitfield, excuse me, George Whitfield also helped with this. Um, I don't know what the phrase alterer is, but on hymnary.org, they have him. Uh, attributed as well. But let me read you the text from this hymn. And I, I'm sure you know it well. You could probably sing it as I read it. But the text says, Hark, the herald angels sing, Glory to the newborn king, Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. 
Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With the angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. And then this is this is such a great stanza, the, the second verse. Christ, by highest heaven adored, Christ, the everlasting Lord, late in time behold him come, offspring of the virgin's womb, veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased with us in flesh to dwell, Jesus, our Emmanuel. Hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace, hail the Son of Righteousness, light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that we no more may die, born to raise us from the earth, born to give us second birth. So even in this hymn, you see the 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 verbiage about the incarnation you see veiled in flesh the godhead see hail the incarnate deity so what does that mean um what is the definition of incarnate or incarnation uh, so once again going back to webster's dictionary of 1828 and i know i like old dictionaries because back then they knew a man was a man and a woman was a woman and they didn't try and fudge the words to help uh, uh further a progressive ag- agenda um, but here they define incarnate as uh to clothe with flesh to embody in flesh or invested with flesh this is the the adjective form invested with flesh embodied in flesh the incarnate son of god they actually use that in the definition that's one of the reasons why i go to the de- the dictionary uh webster's dictionary 1828 is because they will quote the bible in their definitions, like to try and help you understand the use of the word. And I think that's awesome. Uh, So then um, that was incarnate, but incarnation is a noun. The act of clothing with flesh, the act of assuming flesh or of taking a human body and the nature of man as the incarnation of the son of God. So at Christmas, we are celebrating the coming of, of Christ in the flesh. If you've been following me, you know that I have really been on this kick of getting into the confessions and creeds, you know, the uh, the series I've been doing, Christian, What Do You Believe? Um, I'm going to pull from a lot of those resources uh, as well as the Bible as we look at what this celebration entails. What does the incarnation entail? One of the things I'm going to look at is in the 39 articles. This is a document that was uh, created by the Church of England. Um, This was during the Reformation period back in like the 1500s, 1600s. I I forgot to look up when this was actually written. Um, Oh, excuse me, 1552. It's right there in front of my face. So the 39 articles uh, of religion for the Church of England, they have articles 1 and 2. Um, it is article one is of faith in the Holy Trinity and article two is of the word or son of God, which was made very man. Uh, I'm going to read this right now. So article one of faith in the Holy Trinity, there is but one living and true God everlasting without body, parts, or passions of infinite power, wisdom, and goodness, the maker and preserver of all things, both visible and invisible. And in unity of this Godhead, there be three persons of one substance, power, and eternity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Article two of the word or son of God, which was made very man. The Son, which is the Word of the Father, begotten from everlasting of the Father, the very and eternal God, and of one substance with the Father, took man's nature in the womb of the Blessed Virgin, of her substance, so that two whole and perfect natures, that is to say, the Godhood, excuse me, the Godhead and manhood were joined together in one person, never to be divided, whereof is one Christ, very God and very man, who truly suffered, 
was crucified, dead, and buried to reconcile his Father to us and to be a sacrifice not only for original guilt, but also for all actual sins of men. Man, I love these old confessions of of faith. But the reason I read this excerpt is because of what it communicates about the person of Jesus Christ. The birth we celebrate at Christmas isn't just the birth of a great figure of history. It is the celebration of the birth of the God-man, the fully divine, fully human savior of us all. And so as Christmas approaches, the only phrase that has continually come to mind, and I'm sure you've heard this as well, is found in John 1.14, where it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, so what does that mean? Who is the word? Uh, if you have read your Bible or go to church, you already know. So uh, I'm going to read this passage in John, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. I'm actually going to read from the Legacy Standard Bible because I've really been liking that. You can find it online. Um, if you just type in Legacy Standard Bible, it'll, it'll take you to, to their website. Uh, that's just a shameless plug. Somebody please buy me their Bible. It's really expensive, but I love it. John 1, 1 through 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overtake it. There was a man having been sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. There was the true, excuse me, there was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens everyone. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to what was his own and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has been ahead of me, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. So that was John 1, 1 through 18. And uh, and there there is a lot to unpack there, but that is where we get to the phrase, the word, that uh, when we're talking about Jesus Christ. Um, and w- the, the resource I'm going to use to begin to kind of flesh out some of these ideas, because uh, he does a way better job of it than, um, than I have, uh, this is from the commentary on the New Testament use of the Old Testament, edited by, edited by J- G.K. Beale and D.A. Carson. And this is a personal favorite of mine, excuse me, um, because this was uh, given to me by my pastor when he found out I was going into seminary. And uh, this is a great resource to use. It looks at the the New Testament and it just, it shows you all the places in the Old Testament that it is referencing. It's so cool. Um, So as far as John goes. This was a commentary written by uh, Andreas J. Kostenberger. And here's what he says. I'm going to read quite a bit of it. A lot of what I'm going to uh, flesh out today, (laughs) no pun intended, is going going to come from these men who are uh, just juggernauts, giants of the faith. So here is what Kostenberger writes in about uh, John 1, uh, 1 through 18. I'm not going to read all of it, but there's quite a bit here. So please pay attention. It's so good. The prologue's opening words, in the beginning was the word, echo the opening phrase of the Hebrew Bible, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. 
And in an effect, similar to Luke's use of Septuagintal language in the first two chapters of his gospel, establish a canonical link between the first words of the Old Testament scriptures and John's gospel. Yet instead of in the beginning God created, John has in the beginning, for example, prior to creation, was the word. This locates Jesus' existence in eternity past with God and sets the stage for John's lofty Christology, which is unmatched by any of the other canonical Gospels. The term the Word conveys the notion of divine self-expression or speech. The Genesis creation account provides ample testimony to the effectiveness of God's Word. He speaks and things come into being. Both psalmists and prophets portray God's word in close to personified terms, but only John claims that this word has appeared in space-time history as an actual person, Jesus Christ. Most critical in this regard is Isaiah's depiction of God's word as going out from his mouth and not returning to him empty, but as accomplishing what he desires and achieving the purpose for which he sent it. In this passage, Isaiah provides the framework for John's sending Christology, which presents Jesus as the word sent by God the Father, who pursues and accomplishes his mission in obedience to the one who sent him. This sender-sent relationship, in turn, provides the paradigm for Jesus' relationship with his followers. In the following verses of the prologue, the evangelist, after explicitly referring to the word's instrumentality in creation, in verses 1-3, excuse me, in uh, chapter 1, verse 3, continues to draw on Genesis motifs, particularly the contrast between light and darkness, and the notion of life. Significant significantly, light symbolism is also found in later Old Testament prophetic, including messianic passages. The reference to believers' right to become children of God in 112 clearly builds on the Old Testament characterization of Israel as God's children. Um, On the heels of the oblique reference to the rejection of the word by his own in 111, however, the reference to children of God born not of natural descent but born of God in 113 distinguishes between an illegitimate, presumptuous claim of divine sonship sonship based on physical descent and true divine sonship based on faith in the name of God's Messiah. Later in the prologue, one finds allusions to God's presence among Israel during the Exodus. Eskinosin in 114, he pitched his tent, and to God's giving of the law through Moses, uh, 117. In both cases, John's purpose of adducing these Old Testament antecedent passages is to locate Jesus at the climactic end of the spectrum of God's self-disclosure to his people. Okay, all right. I know I've been reading a lot. If you phased out, this, this is where you need to like locate in because this is so important. What he just said here. When he talks about, in verse 114, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, the word there is he pitched his tent. The word became flesh and he pitched his tent. He tabernacled among us. Um, So what he is saying is that uh, this Jesus Christ is the end of God's self-disclosure. God disclosed himself to his people throughout uh, history in many forms, and, and I, I'm going to basically uh, you know, step on his toes here in a second. I'm going to read what he actually says. Um, and so one of those ways was the tabernacle. One of those ways it was the temple. Um, but Jesus Christ is now the fulfillment of all of those things. Here, let me finish what he's saying here. Um, so uh, Old Testament antecedent passages is to locate Jesus as, at the climactic end of the spectrum of God's self-disclosure to his people. In the past, God was present among his people in the tabernacle and the temple Um, But now he has taken up residence among his people in the person of Jesus Christ. In the past, God made himself known through the law, but now he revealed himself definitively in and through Jesus Christ. The reference in 114, and that's, that's where it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten 
from the Father, full of grace and truth. Remember that. The reference in 114 to Jesus taking up residence among God's people, resulting in the revelation of God's glory, the first occurrence of the term doxa in the gospel, also harks back to Old Testament references to the manifestation of the presence and glory of God. And the word there is uh, kebad, uh, be it in the theophanies, the tabernacle, or the temple. Whereas the second temple period was marked by the relative paucity of God's revelation because of Israel's apostasy. And what that means is uh, basically during the second temple period, there were 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, And that is known as the 400 years of silence because there was no new revelation given to God's people during that time. There was no new revelation giving during that time, but it's a really cool period to go back and study because a lot of Daniel's prophecies are fulfilled in that 400-year period. But what he's saying is um, John makes – I'm going to start reading again. John makes clear that now in Jesus, God's glory has taken up residence in the midst of his people once again. To bring glory to God is said to be Jesus' overriding purpose in John's gospel. As he brings glory to God, glory also comes to Jesus. This continues what was true of Jesus already prior to his coming, since glory characterized Jesus' eternal relationship with God. Look at John chapter 17, verse 5. As well as his pre-incarnate state, John 12, verse 41. While on earth, Jesus' glory is manifested to his first followers, particularly through his signs. As the obedient, dependent son, Jesus brings glory to God the Father throughout his entire ministry. However, this he does supremely by submitting to the cross, which for John is the place of God's and Jesus' ultimate glorification. The themes of light and life likewise culminate in the person of Jesus Christ, in whom these divine realities and gifts fine fulfillment. He goes on, but I'm not going to continue reading um, the rest of, I mean, it's a huge book. So yes, you can get it yourself and you can read what Kostenberger has to say about uh, John 1. But I'm going to now turn to another confession. This one is the Belgic Confession. Uh, And this is also going to help us flesh out. (laughs) I don't mean to keep saying that. Um, Help us to, uh, to, to look deeply into the word and to look into the incarnation. And so article 10 of the Belgic Confession is titled, Jesus Christ is true and eternal God. Okay, now before I read this, one of the things I begin, I've begun to encounter as I post things online are people who deny the deity of Christ. So that's why this is so important to understand. And that's why I'm reading these things, so that you all can see that that calling Jesus both God and man isn't some manufactured concept that is just this like, yeah, we'll throw that in there just for giggles. This stuff has biblical authority because it is true. It has authority in your life because it is true. And we know it is true because we, we see it in the Bible. And we see these themes in the New Testament tie to what is revealed in the Old Testament. And all of those things in the Old Testament come to life because of Jesus Christ, which is why Christmas is so awesome to celebrate. It's not just about getting these presents. I love getting presents. I love the celebration surrounding Christmas. Like my my wife made Chex Mix the other day, and I love Chex Mix, but the only reason why she made it was because of Christmas and because she knows that's how um, my mom used to celebrate is she used to bake things and she used to make things like Chex Mix, which my grandmother used to do, and we love it. It's a part of the celebration and tradition, but the reason why we do it is because God came in the flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ, the eternal God, and so this Chex Mix, when I'm eating it, I can give glory to God, not just because he made all of the things that that 
went into this this fantastic bowl of deliciousness and not just because he made me and gave me taste buds and the senses to be able to to figure out what taste is and to find out that wow Chex Mix tastes amazing but because Jesus Christ is Lord Christmas is about that Christmas is about God coming to earth to save his people, uh, to save for him a people, to make for them kings and priests, to redeem them from sin and death. And that is what Christmas is about. And when we understand that it's not just a person who was born under special circumstances, but it is God himself, it is the eternal God, the eternal son, the eternal person of the son being manifested in the flesh, in our, in our nature, as well as maintaining his divine nature. These things are glorious. So let me go back to the Belgian Confession. Article 10, Jesus Christ is true and eternal God. We believe that Jesus Christ, according to his divine nature, is the only begotten Son of God, begotten from eternity, not made nor created, for then he would be a creature, but co-essential and co-eternal with the Father, the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Hebrews 1, 3. Equal unto him in all things. He is the Son of God, not only from the time that he assumed our nature, but from all eternity, as these testimonies, when compared together, teach us. Moses says that God created the world, and the Apostle John says that all things were made by that word, which he calls God. The Apostle says that God made the world by his Son. Likewise, that God created all things by Jesus Christ. Therefore, it must needs follow that he who is called God, the Word, the Son, and Jesus Christ did exist at that time when all things were created by him. Therefore, the prophet Micah says, his goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting, Micah 5, 2. And the apostle, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, Hebrews 7, 3. He therefore is that true, eternal, and almighty God whom we invoke, worship, and serve. Amen. I love the Belgic Confession. I love the confessions. And I love Jesus Christ. And I love God. I love the Godhead. I love Father, Son, Holy Spirit. This is so awesome to see Scripture pointing us to this truth, this eternal truth about who God is, God revealing himself in this way, and not just revealing himself in this way, but also being manifested in the flesh. Um, so why did God need to become flesh? We've talked about the what the incarnation is, but why must it be? And the answer to that is because of the fall of man. We were made in the flesh and we fell. We fell in the garden. This goes back to the Garden of Eden in Genesis uh, chapters 1 through 3 and, well, beyond. And uh, the the work that I'm going to point to in order to help flesh this out in a much more uh, time-friendly manner is the Canons of Dort. Gosh, these places are so cool. Um, (laughs) The Canons of Dort. You can find... um, All of these things online, I mean, they're so old, they are free. Uh, There are some places you would have to pay for them to get them in a, um, you know, fancier form. But um, I found this on the the web and uh, pulled it down. It's a PDF version. I think this is the version that is used by the Reformed Churches of America and Canada. But this is the Canons of Dort, and this is from the third and fourth heads of doctrine. Um, this is on the corruption of man, his conversion to God, and the manner thereof. And I'm only going to read articles one through three. Uh, article one, man was originally formed after the image of God. His understanding was adorned with a true and saving knowledge of his creator and of spiritual things. His heart and will were upright, all his affections pure, and the whole man was holy. But, revolting from God by the instigation of the devil and by his own free will, he forfeited these excellent gifts and in the place thereof became involved in blindness of mind, horrible darkness, vanity, and perverseness of judgment, became wicked, rebellious, and obdurate in heart and will and impure in his affections. That's the end of Article 1. Obdurate just means hardened. Um, 
But what they're talking about is in the Garden of Eden, when God made man and placed him in the garden with, uh, and he made Eve from man. Uh, there they were, a married couple in the garden, tending to the garden. God gave them every tree in the garden to eat of, except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, they weren't even, they weren't allowed to eat of that, or else they would surely die. Well, the serpent came along and deceived Eve, and Eve took it and ate it, and. She gave some to her husband, and her husband willingly went along and ate it. And so um, all men perished. I mean, in in 1 Corinthians, it says, um, in Adam all die. So when Adam ate of this fruit, sin entered and man's spirit died. So anyway, uh, this is where we get to in articles. Article 2, man after the fall begat children in his own likeness. A corrupt stock produced a corrupt offspring. Hence, all the posterity of Adam, Christ only accepted, have derived corruption from their original parent, not by imitation, as the Pelagians of old asserted, but by the propagation of a vicious nature and consequence of the just judgment of God. Article 3. Therefore, all men are conceived in sin and are by nature children of wrath, incapable of saving good, prone to evil, dead in sin, and in bondage thereto. And without the regenerating grace of the Holy Spirit, they are neither able nor willing to return to God, to reform the depravity of their nature, or to dispose themselves to reformation. That's the end of Article 3. So this is uh, working out um, total depravity, which we see in the scriptures pretty plainly. Um, So from the Heidelberg Confession, question 16, it says, why must he be a true and righteous man? Um, and this is all on the uh, the heels of, yeah, I guess uh, because of the nature of the Heidelberg Confession, I should probably figure out what uh, question 15 is about. I know it's talking about man's state in sinfulness and uh, how he must be redeemed, uh, but it's talking about a deliverer. What kind of mediator and deliverer should we look for? Um, and the answer to that in 15 is one who is a true and righteous man, yet more powerful than all creatures. That is one who is also true God. So question 16, uh, why must he be a true and righteous man? The answer is he must be a true man because the justice of God requires that the same human nature, which has sinned, should pay for sin. He must be a righteous man because he who himself is a sinner cannot pay for others. Psalm 49, 7 through 8 says, Truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life, for the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice. That's just one instance where we see uh, how these wages of sin has fully corrupted the entire human race so that I can't die for you, you can't die for me, because we have to pay for our own sins. So this is where the glory of the gospel comes, and this is why celebrating Christmas is so exciting, because when Gabriel announces the birth of Christ to Joseph in um, Matthew chapter 1, it says, But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, Joseph, in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. In this passage, Joseph is betrothed to Mary, to wed Mary, and Mary is uh, becomes pregnant by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit overshadows her, and uh, and so Jesus is conceived, and uh, and so Joseph finds out she's pregnant, and uh, he's considering just divorcing her quietly. He doesn't want to bring her to open shame, and that's why this angel of the Lord appears. And the thing that he communicates to her is that the child is from the Holy Spirit. Mary's not. Uh, you know, being deceptive or anything. It actually is from the Holy Spirit. She's going to bear a son. And he tells, he gives him instructions, name him Jesus. What does the name Jesus mean? It means savior. And the reason why he's going to be named savior is for he will save his people from their sins. So the things that we just read about, the sin that it so depraves man and so corrupts our nature that we are unable to follow after God Jesus is going to save us from that. 
Um, so, and he quotes a passage in Isaiah, which says, um, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Uh, so this son is going to be God with us, not just God on our side, but actual God with us. As we saw in uh, John chapter one, verse uh, 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So uh, some other passages that scripture talks about our sin and our sinfulness is Jeremiah 13, 23. Um, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then you also can do good. That's not saying, oh yeah, they can do that, so you do good. It's a contrasting statement. Uh, can you change your skin? No. Uh, can the leopard change his spots? No. Oh, okay. Then obviously, in contrast, uh, go ahead. You you can't go ahead. Do good if you can, but you can't because you are so corrupt. That's that is the nature of your corruption um, and how much you are in your sins. And in Romans three. Uh, <laughs> Paul gives a laundry list of of Old Testament passages in this chapter that talks about how we are under sin. So this is Romans 3, 9 through 26. And so after he does this, he goes on to give us some good news about Jesus Christ and God's working through him. So Romans 3, 9 through 26. What then? Are we better? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. All right, let me interject here. This is uh, verse 12. This is him quoting all those Old Testament passages. He's not giving references, uh, but he is piecing together things in the Psalms and the Prophets that this is what they say. All right, let's jump back here into verse 13. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues, they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are in the law, so that every mouth may be shut and all the world may become accountable to God. Did you just hear that? All the world may become accountable to God because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Okay, let me jump back in real quick. This is pointing back to John, uh, John chapter one, where it says, uh, "For the law was given through Moses; grace and truth came through Jesus Christ." All right, prepare yourselves because because it's coming. Um, that was twenty one. Uh, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. Did you catch that? Grace, Christ Jesus, being justified. So all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God, but being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith uh, for a demonstration of his righteousness, because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So we're talking about justification here by faith alone in Christ alone. Do you see how Christmas is so exciting? Are you beginning to see how all of this stuff ties together? Uh, all of these passages of scripture, they communicate a single concept about the redemption of humanity. Let me go back to um, 
to the word propitiation in verse 25, um, being justified as a gift by his grace of the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith for a demonstration of his righteousness. Um, propitiation means in, in theology, the atonement or atoning sacrifice offered to God to assuage his wrath and render him propitious to sinners. Christ is the propitiation for the sins of men. Now, what does propitious mean? These are not words we use in everyday conversation. So propitious is an adjective. It means disposed to be gracious or merciful, ready to forgive sins and bestow blessings. And this is applied to God. So by Jesus being our propitiation, uh, he makes God propitious towards us. By Jesus being the atonement or atoning sacrifice offered to God to assuage his wrath and render him propitious to sinners, we therefore receive God's gracious um, and his grace and his mercy. Um, And God is ready to forgive our sins and to bestow blessings. Ah, man. So all of this is played out because of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And not just the incarnation of Jesus Christ, but the mediation of Christ. And all from all of that flows our redemption. We sinners are righteous because of Christ's righteousness. That's what Romans says in chapter one, uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation. Um, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. Let me see. Uh, and so this is one sixteen. for I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. How does this work out? We're going to read how this works out in Christ. I mean, we've already worked it out a little bit, but let's work this out a little bit farther. So we're going to read more about how Christ is the mediator of the covenant of grace. By grace, you have been saved. Um, As it says in Ephesians, not by works um, so that no man can boast. Uh, And that is Ephesians chapter two. Uh, All these verses come to mind and I'm like, I have them half memorized, but um, for we are, excuse me. Ephesians chapter 2, and it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, so that we would walk in them. These, ah man, the gift of God. We have been saved through faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is the gift of God. Another thing that you celebrate at Christmas, when you are giving out presents to everyone, um, it is well within your right. And this isn't being chintzy or, or, um, you know, cheesy or anything like that. You can remind your children as you are giving these gifts out, you can remind your family members, not just your children, but you can give this to them and you can be like, here's a gift for you. This is, this is a reminder that, uh, that, we have a gift from God and it is the salvation by grace through faith that comes through Jesus Christ, comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Um, And so this gift is a reminder to you of that truth. And that is one way you can start a conversation with your unbelieving friends or family or, or one way that you can begin instilling that concept in your children that we're not doing this just for materialism. We're not just doing this because we love one another. We're doing this in memory and in celebration of the greatest gift that we have ever received, and that is our salvation through Jesus Christ. So as we look at um, this, let's go to the Westminster Larger Catechism versus, uh, not versus, oh gosh, question 36. It is, who is the mediator of the covenant of grace? So if we've been, if we've been saved by grace, for by grace you have been saved through faith, we need a mediator of this covenant. 
Um, The only mediator of the covenant of grace is the Lord Jesus Christ, who being the eternal son of God, of one substance and equal with the Father, in the fullness of time became man, and so was and continues to be God and man, in two entire distinct natures and one person forever. So, Question 37, how did Christ, being the Son of God, become man? Christ, the Son of God, became man by taking to himself a true body and a reasonable soul, being conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary, of her substance, and born of her, yet without sin. Why was it requisite that the mediator should be God? It was requisite that the mediator should be God, that he might sustain and keep the human nature from sinking under the infinite wrath of God and the power of death. So let me remind you, um, the wages of sin is death. So sin had to be paid for. Those wages, we had to pay up and we couldn't do it. We had to pay for our our own personal sins and our original sin. And that is an eternal process. And that is why Jesus needed to be, that is why the Christ had to be man and the mediator had to be God at the same time. So that in our nature, uh, the human nature, um, it could be punished, but the divine nature uh, would sustain and keep the human nature from sinking under the, infinite wrath of God and the power of death, give worth and efficacy to his sufferings, obedience, and intercession, and to satisfy God's justice. That I, I should just read the thing instead of talk. Procure his favor, purchase a peculiar people, give his spirit to them, conquer all their enemies, and bring them to everlasting salvation. Just a reminder, if you look up these uh, questions and answers, there are footnotes for scripture references that give credence to why they put them in there. They're not just making stuff up. Why was it requisite that the mediator should be man? It was requisite that the mediator should be man, that he might advance our nature, perform obedience to the law, suffer and make intercession for us in our nature, have a fellow feeling of our infirmities that we might receive the adoption of sons and have comfort and access with boldness unto the throne of grace. Why was it requisite that the mediator should be God and man in one person? It was requisite that the mediator who was to reconcile God and man should himself be both God and man, and this in one person, that the proper works of each nature might be accepted of God for us and relied on by us as the works of the whole person. Why was our mediator called Jesus? Our mediator was called Jesus because he saveth his people from their sins. Matthew one twenty one. Hey, look at that. And then the last question I'm going to read, why was our mediator called Christ? Our mediator was called Christ because he was anointed with the Holy Ghost above measure and so set apart and fully furnished with all authority and ability to execute the offices of prophet, priest, and king of his church in the estate both of his humiliation and exaltation. And uh, it goes on and on with the catechism. Um, But just a little bit of trivia for you guys who don't know, Christ is the Greek word for Messiah. Um, And so um, that is another reason why we uh, we call Jesus Christ. Um, We're not slighting the uh, concept of a Messiah. It is just the Greek word for Messiah. Um, And Jesus was born into a Greek-speaking world, world, (laughs) a Greek-speaking word, (laughs) <laughs> it was the word born into a Greek speaking world. All right. So that was the Westminster uh, Larger Catechism. So one other place that works this out in great extent is the Belgic Confession. We're going back to that in uh, Articles 18 through 20. So this is also where we're going to see um, uh, the... Recovery of fallen man in Article 17, followed by the incarnation of Jesus Christ. So in Article 18, it says, We confess, therefore, that God has fulfilled the promise which he made to the fathers by the mouth of his holy prophets when he sent into the world at the time appointed by him his only his own only begotten and eternal son who took the form of a servant and came in the likeness of men, Philippians 2.7, really assuming the true human nature with all its infirmities, sin accepted. 
being conceived in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit without the means of man, and did not only assume human nature as to the body, but also a true human soul that he might be a real man. For since the soul was lost as well as the body, it was necessary that he should take both upon him to save both. Therefore, we confess, in opposition to the heresy of the Anabaptists who deny that Christ assumed human flesh of his mother, that Christ partook of the flesh and blood of the children, Hebrews 2.14, that he is a fruit of the body of David according to the flesh, Acts 2.30, born of the seed of David according to the flesh, Romans 1.3, a fruit of the womb of Mary, Luke 1.42, Born of a woman, Galatians 4.4, 4, a branch of David, Jeremiah 33.15, a rod from the stem of Jesse, Isaiah 11.1, 1, sprung from the, tri- <laughs> good morning, sprung from the tribe of Judah, Hebrews 7.14, descended from the Jews according to the flesh of the seed of Abraham, since he took on him the seed of Abraham, Galatians 3.16, and was made like his brethren in all things, sin accepted, Hebrews 2.17, 4.15, so that in truth, he is our Emmanuel, that is to say, God with us, Matthew 1, 23. That was Article 18. Now ready the next canon, Article 19, the union and distinction of the two natures in the person of Christ. We believe that by this conception, the person of the Son is inseparably united and connected with the human nature, so that there are not two sons of God, nor two persons, but two natures united in one single person, yet each nature retains its own distinct properties. As then, the divine nature has always remained uncreated without beginning of days or end of life, filling heaven and earth, so also the human nature so also has the human nature not lost its properties, but remained a creature, having beginning of days, being a finite nature, a and retaining all the properties of a real body. And though he has by his resurrection given immortality to the same, nevertheless he has not changed the reality of his human nature. For as much as our salvation and resurrection also depend on the reality of his body." But these two natures are so closely united in one person that they were not separated even by his death. Therefore, that which he, when dying, commended into the hands of his father was a real human spirit departing from his body. But in the meantime, the divine nature always remained united with the human, even when he lay in the grave, and the Godhead did not cease to be in him any more than it did when he was an infant." though it did not so clearly manifest itself for a while. Wherefore, we confess that he is very God and very man, very God by his power to conquer death, and very man that he might die for us according to the infirmity of his flesh. If you have made it this far, I just want to reiterate the fact that these people didn't make this up. It is all there in the scriptures. This is what the Bible teaches, and this is what Christians believe. Um, and so I want to encourage you to be like the Bereans who who heard what uh, the apostles were teaching, and they accepted it with an open heart, but then they went back to the scriptures and they searched it out for themselves. So if you're struggling with these concepts, that's what I encourage you to do. Go search the scriptures themselves and figure out why they say, uh, well, why these men, these reformers wrote down these articles and they say what they say. Uh, so I'm not done with the Belgic Confession yet. We have one more article left, Article 20, and it is titled, God has manifested his justice and mercy in Christ. Are you ready for this? We believe that God, who is perfectly merciful and just, sent his son to assume that nature in which the disobedience was committed, to make satisfaction in the same, and to bear the punishment of sin by his most bitter passion and death. God therefore manifested his justice against his son when he laid our iniquities upon him and poured forth his mercy and goodness on us who were guilty and worthy of damnation out of mere and perfect love, giving his son unto death for us and raising him for our justification that through him we might obtain immortality and life eternal. Ah, and it's true. 
Go to the scriptures. Read what Isaiah talks about when uh, it, when he's giving the prophecy in in fifty three in chapter fifty three, and he says, "But he was pierced for our transgressions; he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed." Uh, it goes on in uh, in uh, verse ten. It says. Um, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities." Uh, we don't have time to go into all of this prophecy in Isaiah 53, but I am sure you've read it during Easter time, at least, if not during during the Christmas time. Uh, but this isn't just the only um, prophecy that Jesus Christ fulfills, but it is a big one. It is a huge one that Jesus Christ fulfills in the incarnation, his his birth on this earth and uh, in his perfect life, his perfect sinless life and his death on a cross on our behalf, taking the punishment that was due us upon himself, the eternal wrath of God. And, uh, and guys, this is why Christmas is so exciting. This is why the incarnation is so glorious. This is why the gospel is such good news. It is because God is with us in the person of Jesus Christ. He's not just around us. He is. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere. But he is present in the flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. And that's what we celebrate at Christmas and all of the meaning that comes behind that. I mean, peace on earth and goodwill toward men. That message came from the Father at the birth of Jesus Christ because of this, because of the gospel. The peace, the peace that we have, the peace that we have because of Jesus Christ. He came to take our chastisement our punishment uh, for our sins so that we may have peace with God once again. So I am going to finish up this uh, this episode by reading from uh, chapter 8 of the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith. Yes, I've read from the Westminster Larger Catechism, um, but uh, the Baptist Confession of Faith is basically the Westminster Confession of Faith, but um, tailored to what Baptists believe about uh, believers' baptism. But chapter 8 uh, is about Christ, the mediator. And it goes through all of this stuff and it gives footnotes. I would recommend going to founders.org. They have a free copy on their website of all the articles of the Baptist Confession of Faith, and it is translated into modern English. And this confession also comes with footnotes and, uh, and scripture references. So yes, please go use that resource. The uh, They have it in book form as well. It's like $5. And uh, that's another thing that I would really like for Christmas. But we get to chapter eight, and it is titled Christ the Mediator. And it says, God was pleased in his eternal purpose to choose and ordain the Lord Jesus, his only begotten son, according to the covenant made between them to be the mediator between God and humanity. God chose him to be prophet, priest, and king, and to be head and savior of the church, the heir of all things and judge of the world. From all eternity, God gave to the son a people to be his offspring. In, the, in time, these people would be redeemed, called, justified, sanctified, and glorified by him. 2. The Son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, is truly and eternally God. He is the brightness of the Father's glory, the same in substance and equal with him. He made the world and sustains and governs everything he has made. When the fullness of time came, he took upon himself human nature with all the essential properties and common weaknesses of it, but without sin. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary. The Holy Spirit came down upon her and and the power of the Most High overshadowed her. Thus, he was born of a woman from the tribe of Judah, a descendant of Abraham and David, in fulfillment of the scriptures, to whole 
perfect, and distinct natures were inseparably joined together in one person without converting one into the other or mixing them together to produce a different or blended nature. This person is truly God and truly man, yet one Christ, the only mediator between God and humanity. 3. The Lord Jesus in his human nature, united in this way to the divine in the person of the Son, was sanctified and anointed anointed with the Holy Spirit beyond measure. He had in himself all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The Father was pleased to make all fullness dwell in him so that being holy, harmless, undefiled, and full of grace and truth, he was thoroughly qualified to carry out the office of mediator and guarantor. He did not take his this office upon himself, but was called to it by his father, who put all power and judgment in his hand and commanded him to carry them out. The Lord Jesus most willingly undertook this office. To discharge it, he was born under the law and perfectly fulfilled it. He also experienced the punishment that we deserved and that we should have endured and suffered. He was made sin and a curse for us. He endured extremely heavy sorrows in his soul and extremely painful sufferings in his body. He was crucified and died and remained in a state of death, yet his body did not decay. On the third day, he arose from the dead with the same body in which he suffered. In this body, he also ascended into heaven, where he sits at the right hand of his Father interceding. He will return to judge men and angels at the end of the age. 5. The Lord Jesus has fully satisfied the justice of of God, obtained reconciliation, and purchased an everlasting inheritance in the kingdom of heaven for all those given to him by the Father. He has accomplished these things by his perfect obedience and sacrifice of himself, which he once for all offered up to God through the eternal Spirit. 6. The price of redemption was not actually paid by Christ till after his incarnation, yet the virtue, efficacy, <clears throat> excuse me, efficacy and benefit of it was imparted to the elect in every age since the beginning of the world, in and by those promises, types, and sacrifices that revealed him and pointed to him as the seed that would bruise the serpent's head, and the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He is the same yesterday and today and forever. Man, that one gets me so much every single time. But uh, okay, seven. In his work of mediation, Christ acts according to both natures, by each nature doing what is appropriate to itself. Even so, because of the unity of the person, that which is appropriate to one nature is sometimes in Scripture attributed to the person under the designation of the other nature. And uh, there are footnotes for that. John 3.13 and Acts 20, verse 28. And then number eight. To all those for whom Christ has obtained eternal redemption, he certainly and effectually implies, applies and imparts it. He intercedes for them unites them to himself by his spirit, and reveals to them in and by his word the mystery of salvation. He persuades them to believe and obey and governs their hearts by his word and spirit. He overcomes all their enemies by his almighty power and wisdom, using methods and ways that are perfectly consistent with his wonderful and unsearchable governance. All these things are by free and absolute grace, apart from any condition for obtaining it that is foreseen in them. 9. This office of mediator between God and humanity is appropriate for Christ alone, who is the prophet, priest, and king of the church of God. This office may not be transferred from him to anyone else, either in whole or in part. And the last uh, item here in chapter 8 is uh, item 10. The number and character of these offices is essential. Because we are ignorant, we need his prophetic office. Because we are alienated from God and imperfect in the best of our service, we need his priestly office to reconcile us and present us to God as acceptable. 
because we are hostile and utterly unable to return to God and so that we can be rescued and made secure from our spiritual enemies, we need his kingly office to convince, subdue, draw, sustain, deliver, and preserve us for his heavenly kingdom. That is chapter 8 of the 1689 uh, Baptist Confession of Faith. And guys, like if you go to uh, to founders.org and you see these footnotes and you go and you look at them and you read the scripture, because this alone is great and glorious, these things that they have pulled out. But when you go to the scripture and you find out that they are true, it is, it's life-changing. This is the God whom we serve. This Jesus Christ is the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's the one who saved you. He's the one that you and I serve with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he gives us the Holy Spirit to be able to do that. And when we walk in this world and all the uncertainty of tomorrow, we know that today we are secure and we have no worries about tomorrow because because let tomorrow worry about itself. But today, this is the day that the Lord has made. And so we will rejoice and be glad in it, no matter the circumstances circumstances. Rejoice, Christian, rejoice, because Christ is king. He's not just king. He is the prophet, the priest, and the king. And this is the one who reconciles you to to God. This is the one who makes a relationship with God even possible, even a concept that you can fathom. Otherwise, you are an object of God's justifiable wrath. I mean, I don't know if you understand like the the concept of being an object of wrath, but when I think about it, I think about uh, uh, like I've been angry and I have I've split wood. I've had to do something physical, so like splitting wood really helps get my head clean. Um, but like in those moments, those those uh, little tiny logs, those are objects of my wrath, and I I carry out my wrath with full vigor, and uh, and that is. <sighs> That is just a small drop in the bucket of the eternal wrath of God that was due to us justly and rightly because of our sin, but poured out on Jesus Christ, him getting in our place, taking the brunt, the full measure of the wrath of God so that you and I might be partakers of Jesus's righteousness eternally. And immortal forever and ever. Guys, Merry Christmas. Like this, knowing these truths gives us a more robust faith. And it informs our celebrations of these holidays, these holy days. And uh, and Jesus Christ is king and is able to make days holy. And we can celebrate him you know, 24-7, 365, because Jesus Christ is Lord. Um, And so this will help you to keep a more robust celebration of Christmas, and it, it refines our joy. Store these things up in your heart. Store these truths up in your heart. It will equip you and prepare you in season and out of season to give answer for the hope which you have in Jesus Christ. We are blessed beyond measure to serve a God who does all of this for us and and more than we can ask or imagine. Ah, men and women, if you've made it this far, I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. A Merry Christmas to you. God bless you. And uh, give thanks to the Lord God for Jesus Christ this Christmas season and live every day unto him. Commit all your ways to the Lord. That is going to do it for today. Merry Christmas, everyone, and God bless. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Battle and the Bride. If you liked this episode, please subscribe, share, and leave a review. For more information, visit thebattleandthebride.com. If you have any questions, you can email us at thebattleinthebride at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and God bless.